been a message that's been on my heart for quite some time. Simply this idea of, of looking up. Like never before, we have more and more things to keep our attention downward. Like never before, we have more resources and avenues to keep our head in the sand. Just look around. When you're in the restaurant, when you're walking through the mall, when you're out and about, notice where people's heads are at. They're down these days. Like never before, we have more things to take our attention off of what's going on around us and to put it on something else. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 16, God's Word says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We do thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, I thank you for your word and I praise you for it. I'm thankful for the power that resides in your word. I'm thankful that you've made it available to us to speak to our hearts. Lord, I know there are those that that this message will hit home with. I know there are those that need to listen to this message because you wouldn't have given it to me if it were not so. Lord, I pray that you open our minds and ears. Help us be attentive, Lord, to what you have to say this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Little boy was in class one day and he was drawing a picture and the teacher asked him, what are you drawing? And he said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, well, well, son, nobody knows what God looks like. To that, he responded, they will when I get through. <laughs> Amen. I want to ask you a question and I want you to think about it. What does God look like to you? What does God look like to you? What is your perception of the almighty God of the universe? The God who created everything that we know. Even those things that we don't know. What does God look like to you? You may say, well, nobody really knows. What God looks like, Pastor. And perhaps that's true in a physical sense. But what about in a mental or spiritual sense? What does God look like to you? I can't answer that question. Your friend can't answer that question for you. Your parents can't answer that question for you. Your, your best friend can't answer that question for you. But I can say this. What God looks like on the inside has a lot to do with what you're looking at on the outside. What God looks like on the inside has a lot to do <clears throat> with what you're looking at on the outside. The Bible often tells us to look up. Isaiah 40, 26 says, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these things. He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. 
Psalm 121.1 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. Psalm 105.4 says, look up to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Why do we look up? Pastor, what's the significance of looking up? Psalm 14.2 and Psalm 53.2 both says these words. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand. Any who will look up. You see, it's important for you to look up because God is looking down. God's looking down upon us, so it's important that we look up to Him. You know, if you're carrying on a conversation with someone, if they're taller than you, you look up to them and look them in the eyes. Don't you? If they're shorter than you, you look down into their eyes to carry on a conversation with them. There's something about looking in to the eyes of the one that you're talking to. It, it, it wouldn't make any sense if, if somebody's a couple of feet taller than I am and, and they, they come up talking to me and I say, yeah, it's, it's, good, it's good to meet you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, let, let me tell you about my life. And, and the, that doesn't make any sense, does it? There's something about looking up to the one that you're talking to. When it comes to our relationship with God, what you look at and what you long for is very, very important. Here's what I've learned in my own life. If I look at God wrong, how I look at myself is going to be wrong. If I look at God wrong, then how I look at my life will be wrong. If I look at God wrong, then how I look at others will be wrong. If I look at God wrong, then how I look at success will be wrong. If I look at God wrong, then how I view giving will be wrong. If I look at God wrong, then how I look at what's important in this life will be wrong. If you look at God in a wrong way, your relationship with God is naturally going to be wrong. Most of us, our problems don't have anything to do with politics or positions or persons or policies, but rather with our perception of who God really is. Looking up will help you keep things in the right perspective because God measures and sees things completely different than we do. For example, it's obvious that as we get older, as we grow older, we deteriorate inside. Wouldn't you agree? We, as, our, as our outside gets older, our inside gets older, right? But that's how we view it. Look, look at what the scripture says in verse 16 of our passage. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man, is being renewed day by day. You see, God has designed our lives as Christians to get younger on the inside as we get older on the outside. Why is this important? The crux of the message is this. Like never before, we have more and more reasons to look down. This message isn't a knock on technology, social media, computers. I, I don't want you to get that idea as I'm going through this message because I have and I use all of them. So uh, it, this isn't necessarily a, a, a knock on anybody who, who, who participates in uh, computer activities or social media or, or, or th those kinds of things. That's not the point. But I do think there's something to be said about raising a generation that constantly has their head down. I think there's something to be said about this generation of people that continue 
to walk around and do things with their head buried in the sand. Just as it's important to look up, there are some reasons to limit ourselves from looking down. I want to give some of those to you this morning. I think it's very, very important. The statistics are clear. This whole process of what's happening in America, what's happening in the world with technology and all these avenues of keeping our head downward, there's some things that are being created. There are some things that's happening that has never happened before to the extent that it's happening. So I want to give you some things. Church, if you continue to keep your head down, it'll take your eyes off your spouse. I want you to get this. If you continue to keep your head down, buried in things, it'll take your eyes off your spouse. America is one of the most technologically advanced nations in all the world. And there's a price that we're paying for that. Pornography is a $20 billion business annually. Half of that is coming straight from the United States of America. It's been estimated that 80% of men in our country have been addicted at one point in their life to pornography. Church, there's roughly 200 people here. Roughly a hundred men. If statistics are true, there's only about 20 of us that have never been addicted to this thing that's killing marriages called pornography. It's become an epidemic in our world and in our nation and in our families. Seven out of ten teenagers in America hide their internet use from their parents. Seven out of ten teenagers are looking at stuff that their parents have no idea what they're looking at. Over 50% of teenagers are exposed to pornographic material before the age of 16. In the last few years, internet use has become one of the top reasons for divorce in our country. Used to, you hear about, uh, there's alcohol, there's drugs, there's this, there's that. Uh, they, they, They just lie all the time. Now, one of the top reasons that we're separating is because so and so can't get their eyes off of the computer screen. Church, there's something to be said about that. If you continue to keep your eyes buried, know this, eventually it'll cause you to take your eyes off your spouse. Have you ever noticed what happens in basketball when a player is fouled, they go to the foul line? And they shoot the free throws. And, and you always behind the goal is fans of the other team waving up flags, waving up all kinds of posters, trying to distract the player from making the shot, right? But if you've ever heard interviews of a seasoned veteran, and when they're asked about, what do you do with all those distractions? Usually their answer is the same. I really don't even know that they're there because I'm so focused on the goal. I really don't even know that they're there because I'm so focused on the goal. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. If you keep your eyes on your spouse, you won't develop eyes for anybody else. If you keep your eyes where they need to be, If you lift up each other, you won't develop eyes for anybody else. Hey, listen, it's okay if you work out. It's okay if, ladies, you get another earring, whatever you want to do. But but make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Make sure you're doing it for your spouse and not somebody else. 
We want to advertise all these things that we do to our bodies. But who are we doing it to? Doing it for? Because nobody should be looking at it except your spouse. It's quiet. Church is important. Nobody wants to talk about it. The church isn't wanting to talk about it. But it's the number one killer of families in America. It's destroying us. You better get a handle on what's happening when you've got a phone or an iPad or a computer in front of your face. You better be aware of what's happening. A lot of people won't want to admit it. And they think in their mind, oh, it's okay. Nobody knows. Eventually I'll kick it. I had a cousin that raised pit bulls. And, and he'd, he'd raise them from the beginning. I mean, a puppy. Man, they'd be around kids. He'd teach them to be around all kinds of big crowds and everything. And, and, and after years and years of raising these things, I, I, I'll never forget what he told me one time. He said, Jamie, I mean, so, some, sometimes they're fine, but, but most of the time, I, I, you never know when it's coming, but this is what I've learned from years and years of raising these pit bulls. Something happens one day and they just snap. They may snap one time and you never have a problem. But usually when they do, it's lethal. Hey, listen to me. Your thoughts, what you're looking at behind closed doors it will come back to bite you one day. You'll never know where, when it's coming. You may think you have control of it. You may think that, that you know exactly how to delete the history and how to delete all the past stuff, but eventually it will bite you. The devil will give you a way out for so long. But eventually... Eventually, it'll bite you. You keep your head down. It'll take your eyes off your spouse. It's been estimated that in over 30% of marriages in America, at least one spouse has had an inappropriate online relationship. There's nothing that I have available online that Brandy can't look at. There's nothing that she has. She don't have no secret account. I've got passwords to everything. She's got the same. Because there's nothing to hide. I hear this stuff. Oh, so-and-so don't know. She don't know how to get in mind. He don't know how to get in. Well, they better... Because eventually it'll come back to bite you. Don't think that you're stronger than the world, that you're stronger than your feelings. Don't give yourself that credit. It'll take your eyes off your spouse. The second thing, you keep your head down, it'll take your eyes off your service. It'll take your eyes off your service. Church, we're all called to serve God. We're called to serve His kingdom. We're called to be servants of Him. And if we're not serving God, we're serving ourselves. And when we serve ourselves, we begin looking at others instead of what we need to do. A man was getting his windshield washed at a particular station. The attendant wiped and washed the windshield and after, after he was done, the, the man in the car just started screaming, man, do you not know how to wash a windshield? It don't even look like anything's been done. So the attendant washed the windshield again. Then after he was done, the old man said the same thing. Man, you need to go back to school to learn how to wipe a windshield. It doesn't even look like you've touched it with a rag or a wiper or anything. Do you not know what you're doing? This happened a couple more times. Finally, the wife leaned over and 
took the man's glasses off and wiped them real good and gave them back to him. Then the man finally drove off, being able to see through his windshield. Church, we want to change the world. We want to do great things for everybody. And and all the while, we forget to change ourselves. Listen, most of the time, the problem isn't somebody. The problem isn't something. Most of the time, the problem is us. Don't allow the world to take your eyes off of what's most important in this world. You remember when Isaiah saw the Lord, it it caused him to, to see himself for who he really is. When he finally got to that place where he looked and gazed upon the Lord, it also caused him to look deep and notice his failures on the inside. And who he really uh, really was. Listen, when you, when, you, when you finally look at God for who he really is, you'll be able to see yourself for who you really are. And church, who we really are ain't near as good as what we think we are. We're not near as strong as what we give ourselves credit for. Someone said, she... We're constantly trying to compare ourselves to each other. Wonder why we do that. Does that make ourselves feel better? I mean, even Christians, we do it, don't we? Pastor, I'm just so glad that, you know, I don't even wear makeup, but so and so has got to put that makeup all over. Maybe you should put makeup on. <laughs> Amen? It's amazing how, how, Prideful Christians are. Pastor, I, I don't even watch TV. Did you know that? I don't even have cable. I don't even, well, maybe you should because I can show you a lot of uh, TV programs that are some self help programs that's a lot better than you staying on Facebook all day worrying about everybody else trying to fix their problems instead of your problems. Church, if you go to the bathroom, who needs to know that? I, 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 I'm being serious. If, 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 whether it's one or two, nobody needs to know that. Nobody needs to know that. It's just so fun. I'm going to get away from this for just a second. It's amazing. You hear people say, I even have Christians that'll say, you know what? I, I, I don't really post a bunch of Christian stuff. I don't really want to post what the church is doing because I don't want my wall filled up with all kinds of stuff. And then you go to their wall and it's filled with the craziest stuff you can think of. <laughs> and it, doesn't that seem odd? We're okay telling somebody that we're about to do number two in the bathroom but don't want to tell nobody that we're going to church. Are y'all following me? I don't know if I should have said that. Here's what I've realized in my life. The more I think about God, the less I think about myself. And there's only two ways to live, church. You're either full of self and you're empty of God. Or we're full of God and empty of self. It's amazing how we can be so comfortable with things. We can be so comfortable with with, with hounding people. You know, here's what Facebook, Twitter, here's what this thing has has done for. It's given everybody a microphone. 
It's given everybody a microphone. And see, often, we, we've often thought throughout history that you've got some people that are shy and to themselves and, and don't want anybody to know about it. And then there are others that are just outgoing and, and they blab out everything. But that's really not the case. It's just some don't have the courage to tell nobody what's going on. So they use Facebook. And they use all these social media things to say all kinds of things that's really in their heart, but they don't have the guts or the courage to say it out loud. We don't want nobody inviting us to church on Facebook. I'm sorry, I'm rambling on this. It's, it's a little, uh, little heated for me. We don't want nobody inviting us to church on Facebook. But we'll hound people over and over selling some kind of stuff. We okay? Hey, I, I'm not against you making money. You need to. Whatever you can do to do it, do it. But if you're gonna, how can you be so okay with hounding somebody over and over about selling, about doing something, and be ashamed to pronounce the gospel on your wall? Church, that don't add up. I knew this was gonna be tough. But church, it's been, it's been, it's been dear to my heart. I've seen friendships, I've seen marriages, I've seen families broken up because of this junk. Instead of going to them and talking to them, we want to shed all kinds of stuff on the internet. Don't allow the world, don't allow it to take you, your eyes off of what's most important. Church, no matter how much you make, no matter how much you do, no matter how much you accomplish, that's nothing compared to what you do for the Lord when it's over. Don't lose sight of that. Don't allow the things of the world to take your eyes off serving God. That's what's most important. Number three. It'll take your eyes off your spouse. It'll take your eyes off your service. And it'll take your eyes off your Savior. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, this is what it says. It says, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Church, Jesus died for you. Some company didn't die for you. Some person some family member didn't die for you. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, died for you. Listen to me. He didn't die for you to make a lot of money. He didn't die for you to be successful. He didn't die for you to be popular. He didn't die for all your plans to go according to what you want. He died so that you can spend eternity with Him one day. What he did for you has nothing to do with what goes on here. Except doing what he wants you to do. Don't allow the things of the world to take your eyes off of him. He's, he is what's most important. There was this boy who was looking at the reflection of the moon. Glistening in a pond. A friend threw a rock as we like to do. In the water. And the ripples. Went throughout the pond. and 
And the little boy noticed and he began looking for the moon again. And he said, the, what happened? The moon is gone. And then his friend explained to him, hey man, look up. The moon is still there. The moon didn't disappear. Church, this is what happens in our life. We get to looking down all the time with, with the concept of knowing Jesus and will we believe in Jesus? But if you keep your head there so long, many times Jesus disappears. God disappears in our life. And we wonder, where is he gone? Why is all this happening? Church, just look up. He doesn't disappear. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't ever abandon you. Look up. He's still there. Don't let the things of the world drown out the glory of God. Don't allow your head to be buried in the sand so much so that you lose sight of the Savior. Several years back, I was in downtown Dallas. And I noticed this. Lifelike mannequin in a store window. I mean, man, it it, it looked she, she looked like a, a mannequin. She was just still, and then I, I noticed her eyes blink. She blinked. I said, It's game on now. I started shouting. I started dancing. I started knocking on that window, trying to do everything I could to get her to move. And, and she wouldn't even look at me. and Because I, I knew if I could just get her to look, I could make her smile or laugh. But she wouldn't do it. You couldn't shake her. And I often thought about that. How come I couldn't do it? Because she was more focused on pleasing her employer than she was pleasing anybody walking down. Downtown Dallas. Church, the devil has his hands up. The devil's waving all kinds of devices and images all in front of you and he'll do it until Jesus comes back. But the only way to keep yourself pure is to put your feet in the dirt and demand and take a stand and say, I'm more interested in pleasing what God wants for my life than I am about pleasing the world or pleasing myself. I'm more interested in pleasing Him instead of pleasing other things. What are you seeking in your life? What are you seeking from the Lord? What does God look like to you? I want you to consider this. We're early for the game, but we're late for worship service. Therefore, we see the game clearer than we see God. Church, that just makes sense, huh? If, if, if you're on time and you make sure you got... Hey, it's amazing that we can set up an entire party, have the food ready and everything for people to come over and be 30 minutes early before the game starts. But church, if you can do that and you're late with everything with God, surely... How you see and view ball games are going to be a lot clearer than the way that you view God. We see to it that our children do their homework, but never check to see if they do their Bible lessons. Therefore, as a result, our children understand the textbook clearer than they do the true book. That makes sense, doesn't it? That's 
that's, that, that's going to be the result. That's going to be the conclusion naturally. We make sure that we get into bed early through the week so that we don't miss work. But we stay up late on Saturday making it difficult to attend Sunday school and many times even church. Therefore, church, when that happens, as a natural result, we're going to be more comfortable in the club than we are the church. Am I making sense? What you look at, how you see things makes a big difference. We'll serve as a room mother, an assistant coach, a trip chaperone, or president of the PTA at school, but never volunteer to serve at church. As a result of that, listen to me, as a result of that, we're able to see the popular life's agenda much more clearer than the personal Lord's agenda. It just comes natural when that happens. We go to work, even though we do not feel well. But we stay at home from church under the same circumstances. Therefore, as a result of that, listen to me, we see our discipline excel in the workplace, but our discipline fails in the worship place. It's natural when we make those decisions of how we look and view things. What you're looking at makes a big difference. It makes all the difference in the world. I'm going to ask you, how does God look to you? What does He look like to you? If somebody were to ask Who is God? What is He? It's hard to give a description of the Lord when everything we see is of the world. It's hard to describe a God who's all-powerful when we're filling our mind with things that hold no eternal power at all. 